Good morning. Uh, welcome to the 16th episode. I'm your host, Elena La, real estate broker and CEO of Union Real Estate. And then today I had the honor uh, to have Ian So from the Chicken and Rice Guys. Uh, he's a business and community leader, and I'm so excited to have this conversation with you, Ian, today uh, about the intangibles of starting a business. So I know that you had a presentation for us. Uh, so I encourage all our audience to ask questions as it comes. So I will be monitoring the Facebook um, feed. So let's start. What do you have for us, Ian, today? Yeah, so I put a presentation together about, uh, you know, the things they don't really teach you in school and things that they uh, may not talk about in business. I went to Babson College. It's the number one school for entrepreneurship uh, in the world. But uh, some of the things they didn't teach me, which is developing yourself, uh, business culture, um, and networking, power of networking. So those are the kind of things I'm going to cover today. Awesome. Can't wait to hear from you. So um, do you want to share your slides right now? Sure, yeah. Sorry, I didn't know I was live. I was, I was scratching my, my beard <laughs> or, or what I have is a beard. But yeah. That makes well, it natural. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's me. Um, cool. So my business is Chicken and Rice Guys. It's a food truck restaurant business. We have uh, six food trucks and three restaurants. So uh, before I get into kind of the meat of the presentation, I want to just tell quickly about my story, how I started it, uh, and give a few tips for those that are looking to start a business. And uh, if you guys have questions, feel free. I think uh, Elena said that we're streaming live on a couple platforms. Feel free to ask questions along the way. And I'll pause at each section for anyone that has uh, any lingering questions. All right, so I'm gonna get into my story. Uh, personal development, networking, culture, those are the three main topics I'll talk about in terms of intangibles. My story started out in uh, 2012, eight years ago. I feel like an old man at this point. <laughs> started when I was 25. Uh, and I feel like every year in business is taking, you know, it's like dog years. Every year is like seven years. I'm probably, what, 78 now or whatever. I can even do math six times, seven times eight, whatever. 72. I'm 72 in entrepreneurship years. And so it all started with, um, I wanted to start a business. And it was simple as that because I did not enjoy my day job. I was I graduated from college and uh, I was like, I'm spending 40 hours a week on something I don't enjoy. I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. I was at the same company for a couple of years and each year I'd get like a, uh, I think a 3% cost of living raise. I was like, okay, well, I want to make six figures by the time I'm 30. It's going to be a long time before I make that money. So I literally got together with my friends um, and I started writing down ideas. And this is the original Word document of all the ideas we put together. And we literally just met up every week uh, and just came up with ideas and we would evaluate them to see if they were good enough. We thought about, okay, can we afford to do this? Do we have the skill to do it? Uh, is this something people would want? And we would kind of use that framework to weed out the ideas. Um, and so we got to coming up with these different ideas. And I, and number 14 was my current business, Chicken and Rice Guys. Uh, so 14, Chicken and Rice Stand, like in New York. And we were inspired because we went to visit New York and we went to this uh, Oh, I don't have the picture, but basically there's a, this, this cart called Halal Guys. Um, and we did the math and we're like, man, they have lines down the block. They have their own Wikipedia page. They're probably making like $6 million a year from this little food cart. So we started researching how to buy a food cart, um, how much it would be, what it takes to run it, what are the permitting. And we realized this is doable. All right, but do you have any experience of cooking or restaurant business back then? No experience. No experience at all. <laughs> no experience, you know. And that's why we kind of chose the ideas. Like, I think some of these ideas were like, oh, we're going to do apps, right? Number three and four, this is 2012. Everybody want to make an app. Um, but we're like, none of us are developers. None of us want to go back to school to learn it. And I personally hate, I took like a technology class. I hated it. So I was like, but food, 
I can at least know if it's good, if it tastes good. Mm -hmm. And what the process is kind of doesn't matter as long as the food tastes good, you know? That's very true. <laughs> yeah. And I'll get into, so kind of the next slide actually is how do we actually test our idea? How do we learn how to do it? Um, and this is, this is very applicable to anybody that's trying to start a business is you literally just test out the product. Uh, as simple as that. I've talked to so many entrepreneurs at this point and um, even like the, the folks, like I've talked to, uh, there's a guy I, I uh, did an event for and he has this award-winning chocolate globally. Um, and he won like 21 awards, it's in like seven different countries. And he started it by just testing out different chocolate recipes and do like even, he did even DNA tracing of where like the cocoa beans came and all that. And for me, it was the same way. You know, I literally called out my friends uh, to try <laughs> all of the recipes I made. I made probably like 50 different recipes of chicken and rice before uh, we were able to get to where it was today. Uh, one of the hardest parts was the white sauce. Uh, if, if people don't, haven't had it, it's like this garlic sauce that goes all over the dish. You know, people, people love it. Uh, we joke, you know, do you want some chicken and rice with your sauce? You know, that's how much people like the food. Okay, so that's why Abby mentioned on one of the comments left is that one part of the intangible assets of a business, your secret sauce. <laughs> Yes, yes, this is a great metaphor for the, uh, the presentation. Yeah, shout out to Abby, thank you. Great sponsor, <laughs> Eastern Bank. <laughs> um, and she makes awesome bread and baked goods. I don't know if she's starting her business yet doing that, but uh, she should be. She should be, it's very delicious. I'm one of her fans. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she's doing it right now. This is exactly, exactly what, if, for those that don't know Abby, she posts these amazing photos of her baking food and all that. Um, and that's what I did in the beginning is that I, I literally just tried different things. And when I started to realize people started to like the recipes, then I was like, okay, you know, now's the time for the next step. And so that's how we did it. We, we started off with very basic, recipes, we made it better and better. Um, and then we bought a food cart, we took that next leap. Okay, so during this product testing period, how long did it take you for you to make that decision that yes, we are ready for the next phase? So um, I think we spent a good six months doing it. Yeah. Okay. Um, keep in mind, we were all working full time. So we would just do this after work. So it wasn't like six months, 24 seven, you know, it was six months of part-time trial and error. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, another, another key, key tip to when uh, doing your product too, is uh, go out and uh, have people try it, but go try other places. So we would go to New York and there's 3000 halal food carts of this style of food. And we tried at least 20 different ones and we took different, um, you know, recipes and, and variations of their menus and, uh, and adjusted it to ours. So we made a better version of, of even the version that we were trying to be. Uh, of yeah. course, and I'm sure like you differentiate yourself from the other similar. Yeah. Products. Yeah. Yeah. And we're still changing the recipe to this day, you know, uh, it's, it, it's uh, Every year there's, there's slight tweaks, yeah. For sure. Yeah, um, and I'll talk a little bit about financing because I think that's a, that's a big question for people is uh, uh, this is our first food truck we bought it in Miami. It used to be a uh, sandwich truck. <laughs> that's okay. me looking at the generator. Uh, I've, you know, I never cooked before and I actually never looked at a generator before this. <laughs> <laughs> That's me trying to look intelligent. <laughs> I see, I was going to ask. <laughs> yeah. We still have this truck. It's our first truck. Um, and do you still maintain that? We do. Yeah. It's, uh, it's got some issues, but uh, it's still running. But yeah, this is a pie chart of how we funded our business. It took about $50,000 for the food truck and all the startup costs. And uh, yeah, we basically split the cost between the partners and a loan from my mom. Mm -hmm. um, 
we used our savings. Um, it took us about a year to start it. So we basically were using our, uh, saving money from our paychecks um, to fund the business. Um, it's not like we had the savings before, um, but we felt passionate about it. And we felt like if anything failed, we could just resell the food truck and get most of our money back. So it's kind of worth, worth the risk. Okay, so from the pool of your partners, any of them has the restaurant background or just you, all of you are zero background in startup business and also um, restaurants? Zero background, yeah. Zero, okay. Zero background, yeah. So this is a great example that even if you don't know anything about the business, you can still make it happen. Yeah, you know, and, and that's what I'm going to get into later. It's like, how do you do that? How do you go from not having experience in business or in food or this whole weird journey of being a small business owner through COVID and all that? How do you learn along the way? Because you have to learn along the way, you know? Of course. Yeah. A um, little bit about marketing. Uh, this is our grand opening day. Uh, you know, I have some tips down here, but what we did is we used... Um, a free offer. We offered free chicken and rice for a year to anybody that would come the first day. So that's how we got a line down the block. <laughs> and we still do that. We still do that. Uh, we are a little bit more creative about it. We give away a golden coin and uh, we print someone's name on it that randomly wins. Every time we open a store, we'll raffle it off um, and they'll get free chicken and rice for life. Oh, wow. And you know, at the end of the day, right? Uh, marketing, when it comes to marketing, exceptional service, that's the most important. When you deliver a great product, um, and even if you make mistakes, if you notice even the best service companies, um, they do make mistakes, uh, but mm -hmm. it's how they fix it. And for us, we make sure we reply to every single you know negative comment um, on Yelp, Google, whatever you name it. We have multiple surveys that go out to make sure we're doing a good job. Um, and uh, if there's an issue, we address it. We, we usually give like full refunds, no questions asked. If there's an issue with your order and we'll give you uh, sometimes a free meal for the next time. Um, but you know, people are gonna make mistakes. People are gonna make mistakes, especially in this industry. Mm -hmm. And it's really how you fix them. And uh, you know, that's the, the best kind of marketing is the service you deliver. That's for sure, very key in any type of business, small or big. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, gonna get into kind of more of the theory. Uh, we'll talk a lot of a lot about theory, but then also uh, reflect on my own experience and share share my stories about how I learned these things um, and how what my thought process is. Any questions before we move on, Elena, about uh, my story? No, I think you cover uh, all of what I have already prepared for your question uh, in this section. Uh, so maybe we can move on to the personal development, how you make yourself stronger and sure a restaurant business. What I see is a very, um, a lot of work, a long hour. So wanna, I'm curious to know how you have been making it happen and then keeping a strong mindset. Yeah, you know, you hit on a, a, a great point about the long hours, you know, for the restaurant industry, it's particularly tough because if anyone has cooked for anyone before of any amount of people, eating the food takes about, I don't know, five to 10 minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah. preparing the food, shopping, cleaning, all of that is a lot of work. So for us, you know, in the beginning, we were working from, you know, 7 a.m. to, uh, you know, 10 p.m. You know, from 7 to, to, to 9, we would be getting ready for the shift, prepping the food, you know, then we would have to drive to the location with the truck, serve the food from like 11 to maybe 2 or 3, only, you know, 3 or 4 hours, and then go back and from 5 to 10, be cooking, cleaning the truck for the next day. So it's, it's, it's a lot of time. Um, and, you know, I, I want to go over a couple things that, you know, kind of, I guess, I guess, uh, let me see, is this the next slide? Actually, I'll skip ahead, but 
this brings me to um, kind of the, the gist of what I'm talking about in personal development. If you walk away with just one thing you want to know is, is this quote is, you know, and it's from this case study called Why Entrepreneurs Don't Scale by John Hamm. It's an amazing Harvard um, case study that I learned from um, part of the small SBA's Emerging Leaders Program. And the quote is, the qualities that serve them well in launching a business often bring them down as the companies grow. So, you know, what that means is like, as your company grows, and this is a, a graph from the case study, is that you go through different stages of business, right? So if you look at the phases at the top, phase one, two, three, four, and five, um, those are like the size of your business and how large your business is and how mature your business is. So in phase one, you grow a lot through creativity. And then in phase two, as your business grows, it becomes about the direction. How are you harnessing that creativity? Phase three is about delegation. How do you get other people to do the job that you're doing? How do I get my employees to serve chicken and rice the way that I know it should be made and deliver the service that I would deliver to customers, right? So as you go through the business, the challenges change. So going back to the quote before, it's like things that helped you. And this, this is a circular way, circular way to get back to the hours that you need to put in the restaurant industry is we needed a lot of grit and mental toughness in the beginning, right? So not only did we put together a lot of hours, a lot of things went wrong, right? We had to tow our food truck the first day, the second day, actually. Oh my um, God. The engine blew up, yeah. It cost us $20,000 to fix. That was, of the, the $50,000 I showed you before, half of that went to fixing the engine. <laughs> oh my so, goodness. <laughs> yeah. Um, but as you move forward in the business, right, um, you learn that these things that are helpful for you in the beginning don't help you later on. You can't just be tough your way through problems later. And I'll share a, 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 lot, of, a lot about that. Another thing too, so, and so building on this, this graph, right? So this is kind of the basic version of <laughs> the stages of business and then they start naming them. So this is, this, this graph looks crazy, but I'll walk you guys through it. So the stages are the phases before, and then these are the names. The first stage of business is existence. You just have an idea, right? For us, that was like, okay, we're building the idea for chicken and rice. Um, we're testing our recipes. Then you go to the survival stage. This is where uh, we actually launched the business and selling that first uh, product that we came up. And then success came when we started getting more food trucks and more restaurants and then taking off as, I don't think we've ever taken off yet um, in terms of you know getting like national distribution or anything. But, but I feel like we've been successful. And the last part is resource maturity. Think of like, large corporations. So now when you go look at the, 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 uh, the y-axis, the vertical, uh, it, it breaks down the graph into what's critical to the company, what's important but managed, and what's irrelevant. So when you look at this top thing, owner's ability to do, at the existing stage, it's very important. But as you go through the stages of your business, that becomes less important. Right. You see this downward trend. And then your ability to delegate, which starts at the bottom over here and is least important because you have no one to delegate to, mm -hmm. that becomes extremely important as you grow, go up in the scale. So when I talk about personal development, right, not only do your strengths hold you back sometimes in the future, your weaknesses need to become strengths and ultimately your business is a reflection of your personal development, right? Are you learning the skills needed to delegate? Are you building the systems? Are you building the people, the quality, the diversity? Are you learning to delegate to others? Hmm. Right? And I would say, yeah, sorry, Elena. It's okay. But um, question here, like since you are talking about delegation and for sure, like once you are growing, you, you cannot cut yourself, and, uh, clone yourself and then go to different places. So that's why delegation is so important. Like what do you recommend to the our audience? Uh, on what is the best way to learn that delegation? Absolutely. So, you know, 
I, I'll explain a little bit more further on, um, but, I, but I'll tell you just quickly, you know, um, for, for us, it has to start with a knowing your strengths and weaknesses, right? Um, let me see, let me, let me, peek. sorry, I just made this presentation this morning. So, but yeah, so finding your weaknesses and strengths, I'll cover that when we get to that. Um, but basically you, you have to know that, and, and for us, we knew because we had no experience in the food industry. We always tried to hire people better than ourselves. So we would always find, try to find people. The first, our first manager had retail experience, uh, working at a clothing store, doing inventory, sales, all that. We actually never even had retail experience, you know, besides cooking experience. So we hired him and he was a big help because he helped us find other people in the industry uh, to work for us. But then he also brought more of that systematic structure that you would see at a larger corporation because he worked at uh, H&M before. And then so through the years, we always try to hire people that knew more than us. Um, and, you know, one of my challenges as an owner is, and, and you know, this, this takes, I think it takes uh, self-awareness, it takes humility, it's knowing your strengths and weaknesses. You got to learn to take a step back, right? The, the very first hire, one of my key hires, uh, he had a ton of experience. He opened six different restaurants, was working in the industry as a dishwasher at the age of 12. Um, so, and then, so he had a ton of experience and then we brought him in, we paid him a lot of money to run our operations. And then his very first training meeting, I came into that meeting, he had his whole agenda, he had all the training material out. And I was like, I don't like this. I'm gonna change everything, <laughs> I'll interrupt. And he didn't tell me this at the time, but he's like, I was about to quit that day, you know? And I'm glad he didn't because he was so important to us growing from, you know, a mom and pop to like a real organization with training systems and stuff like that. So it was very simply, I learned to just take a step back, you know, not, not, not have to be, you know, the one doing all these things, right? And the reason why I bring up these case studies is, is it starts with the knowledge, right? You have to know why these things are important, right? From an academic perspective, mm -hmm. right? These are what, this is what Harvard says, you know, as, as Asians, we know that's like the top academic, you know, area, but yeah, use the data, use the science, and then apply it to yourself, right? Apply it to where your weaknesses are. And I'll get more into that later. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so while this looks, you know, very messy and complicated, right? There's a, a great framework that um, you can use. I'm not gonna get into all of them, but if you break down that graph into all of the things that are important to you uh, and growing, this is a great framework. Um, and each one of these should have a framework. By what I mean by that is like, everyone always talks about the product, right? But underneath the product is all of these different things that make the product great, right? And then in the beginning, it's all about culture, which we'll talk about. Um, and then as you grow, it's about your talent. Who are you bringing in? Then it's about your leadership, organization alignment, how you're developing your talent, how you're evaluating and developing them. Mm -hmm. And then what are your systems around delivering your product, right? So, um, you know, what's really important is building these frameworks around them. And even at the leadership level, and, and there's like pyramids within the pyramids of the framework is, uh, and then this is one, is if you look at your personal leadership, right? Uh, what is important to your personal leadership? Charisma, right? Motivating people, creativity, accountability, continuous learning, your raw intelligence, grit, mental health, physical health, right? So my point is, there are all of these things that you have to do and learn as you grow, right? And, and it, takes, it takes hours and hours of learning, reading, listen to Audible, whatever, you know, and I'm going to, to some of those um, because there's so much to learn and it changes. As your business grows, which is the really the real hard part, you know. Yeah. So it sounds that you are developing yourself every single day. I'm curious to know, like, how long, uh, how does your day look like in terms of like dedicating to personal development or reading books or even exercising? Like, you know, the physical health. Yeah. So let's see. Um, I'll jump ahead to this learning slide. 
So uh, here's several books that are, are that are the most impactful to me. Traction mm -hmm. is one of the best. And, um, and when it comes to development, you have to track things. Um, so traction is a great methodology where it sets up uh, a spreadsheet of how to measure your progress, sets up your goals, and then it sets up a schedule. So for me, uh, I focus for each of the things on my pyramid, um, I have different activities that are dedicated to them. So over the years, I've developed ways of, okay, how do I build this? How do I build that? How do I build this? So in terms of physical health and grit, um, I try to work out a lot, right? So uh, it doesn't look like it, but <laughs> it's on my list of things to do. I schedule out my workouts for the week, put it in my calendar, and then I measure it. And I have a spreadsheet. I measure it. Uh, I check it off when I do it. I try to do it four to five times a week. And then I track it daily, weekly, and monthly. And then when I see where uh, I'll color code it, if I'm on track, it'll be green. If it's off track, it'll be red. And that's where I know which area of my life I need to focus a little bit more on. So right now I know I'm not reading enough. Um, because it's on, it's, cause I'm tracking it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's important to track it because I think you, you measure it, but then th there's also like this, I think just this placebo effect of knowing, of keeping yourself accountable. And that's, that's you know, that's personal accountability, accountability is on there. So spiritual health, that's meditation for me. Uh, continuous learning is, is reading, audibles, uh, and I'll talk about networking uh, a little bit later on. Mm -hmm. Some of these things you can't change. Raw intelligence, you can't change. You got to be okay with that. Uh, <laughs> but it's only one of the factors of many, right? Of course. There is a, a question from our audience coming from Martin Yao. Uh, and his question is, what is your advice to keep mentally tough in that moment when you are facing adversity? You know, I, I would rate myself like a four in terms of <laughs> four out of 10 in terms of toughness. So I'm not the great at, the greatest at this, but um, there is a great book that I like to read. It's, uh, that's one of my favorites. It's called Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. He's a Navy SEAL and a, uh, a Navy SEAL. He's like a marathon runner. Like he runs like 100 mile marathons, 150 mile marathons. He ran a 100 mile race with no training. And the way that he talks about it is you have to callous your mind. You basically have to train your mind to be able to be able to deal with adversity. And there's different ways to do that, that I like to apply, which is, you know, one, I do CrossFit. And at the end, uh, it's, it's a timed exercise for, for half an hour, timed exercise after half an hour. And for me, how I apply that is at the end, I try push myself as hard as I can. And I want to feel like, you know, like I really used all my energy and just felt exhausted at the end. And to me, that's callousing my mind uh, in the sense that it's training my mind to be stronger and stronger. And I think it's a training thing. Um, and so one, it's putting yourself in difficult positions, either physically or mentally, uh, as well as putting yourself in uncomfortable situations. Uh, which, which I'll talk about a little bit later as well. But I think it takes experience, um, especially, you know, what I find is, especially with people uh, grew up in kind of nice childhoods, because if you look at a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, I think 50% of entrepreneurs are either immigrants or, um, or first generation. It's because they have that hunger, they have that grit that they, they grew up with, right? You look at Jay-Z, right? Came from a tough background, but it makes them hungry, you know? So if you don't have that and you're trying to build that, just seek out pain, <laughs> you know? That's how I do it, you know? And I, I try I, I try to, you know, I don't think I'm the toughest guy in the world, but. Yeah. Well, for sure. Like uh, for myself, it's also, is in progress. Always have to think positive and then if not finding that outlet where you can vent out and then like continue on, I think that helps keeping the mind strong and then like facing any adversity or any challenges that we're facing. I think that helps. Yeah, absolutely. You know, another thing that was mentioned in the book that I really love is he says there's like a mental cookie jar is when things are tough, 
you go in and reach into your mental cookie jar and eat a cookie to give you motivation. And those cookies are like your wins in your life, right? So it's like, so I, I, sell, I say to myself when times are tough, like, hey, you've gone through worse things than this. Mm-hmm. And I've gone through so many terrible things in my business. <laughs> um, but it helps me learn that, you know, and remind myself this too shall pass. Like even during coronavirus, that has really helped me because I've gone through so much adversity in my business um, that the, it helped prepare to me, prepare me for coronavirus on a practical, but also a spiritual and mental level because I went through it before. Mm. And so putting yourself in uncomfortable positions, taking risks, failing, really sets you up for the future. You know, and, and I'll get into a lot more of of that yeah. later on too. Well, definitely give you experience. And then the more you go over it, those bumps, it's going to help you become stronger for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Yeah, this, this, this goes right nicely into the next topic. So uh, another great book about this is The Path Made Clear by Oprah. Oprah does a great job about living a fulfilling life all her books are you know make me so happy when I read them but it's so important especially for entrepreneurs to know why you do the things you do right because it is so hard it is so many hours I I constantly have to remind myself why am I doing this why am I washing dishes why am I doing all these things why am I you know delivering food during a pandemic (laughs) you know (laughs) Um, but that's where you know another thing about mental toughness is that alignment that cookie jars why am I doing the things that I do you know what is what is my you know mental motivation so that's a really good book about that Um, and for me it's clear you know for me like I don't think I I I love my business I actually started a new business because um but the reason why I did that is because I realized I'm not passionate so much about cooking food I'm not a cook, I'm not a chef, I didn't have the experience, um, but I am passionate about running a good business and trying to use it to help others uh, make my employees' lives better by providing a good workplace, right? So that, and I'm also passionate because it helps me, it helped me learn so much. In the eight years, I've learned so much more than I did going to business school. And I probably paid a fraction of the price, arguably, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but I definitely made money doing it too, you know, so uh, it's a great learning experience. So it's important to know why you do the things you do. And I think uh, Oprah's, Oprah's book, Path Me Clear, The Things I Know, really good books. Um, Traction is a great book about accountability and knowing yourself. And principles is really important. Going back to the five stages of startups and why entrepreneurs don't, don't scale, uh, those case studies I shared earlier is, a lot of the reasons why entrepreneurs don't make it or they don't get to the next stage is that they keep making the same mistakes over and over again. And principles does a really good job of examining that. And it helps you understand your weaknesses. Um, for me, it's a, it was a lot about not being detail oriented, um, sometimes not taking things seriously enough, you know. Um, and that's where, you know, these books help, but then also, um, you know, other, other ways to learn. I talked about YouTube, Audible, you guys know about that. Um, the ways you can learn about yourself, your strengths and the weaknesses is uh, personality tests. The predictive index, there's, there's a lot out there. I don't think anyone is worse or better than the other, but the predictive index is, is, is really good and easy one. It talks about your work styles, how you work with others, um, how you get along with other people, what people are your ideal partners, so that one is really good. That helped me learn a lot about myself and my strengths and weaknesses. And then there's the Enneagram test, which is more of a personality test. You know, talking about one of my weaknesses is that can be a strength is I'm an optimist, you know, but that makes me really bad sometimes at decision-making because when it comes to decisions, I'm always optimistic. You know, I opened a store in Houston uh, last year and people are like, what made you want to open a store in Houston? Aren't you in Boston? I'm like, you know what? I just thought it'd be a fun adventure and we're going to make it work. (laughs) Well, you know what? It didn't work. We closed it (laughs) several months ago and it was a lot of work traveling, flying back and forth, trying to manage two businesses in completely different areas of America, you know, culturally and geographically. Uh, I would have been much better off 
doing something in Rhode Island or in a nearby city, you know. So, you know, once again, these, these tests, these education, the reading, it's a good base of knowledge to understand, you know, the things that are holding you back from an academic perspective. Um, and then when you understand that, that's where you can move forward and uh, make these changes. That's good, but that optimism is also, I think, help you with the mental toughness that you can face anything a positive note. Yeah, yeah, it's a strength and it's a weakness, you know. For sure. Um, so it takes the learning and then it also takes, um, oh, this is a great book. It, it also takes great feedback from other people. Um, and I read this book, Extreme Ownership. And the lesson is that whatever happens, it's on the leader, right? If your subordinate makes a mistake, it's not their mistake, it's your mistake. And they talk about this with the stories of Navy SEALs is because if you're a leader of these teams in war, you, th those mistakes lead to people dying, right? So that's why they take their leadership and their ownership of their leadership very importantly. Um, and I think that's kind of the mentality that uh, we have to apply as business owners. And that's something that I had to learn through the years. I spent so much time thinking about how my managers were making mistakes or how other people are making mistakes without examining myself. And the only person you can change is yourself. And that's when really I think I learned to make fundamental changes in my business. And the way I learned that is it actually takes uh, feedback from others. That's very important. And that's the, the next slide. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a story before I get into this, the, the story behind this photo. But <laughs> uh, the reason why I re read Extreme Ownership is we had just acquired another restaurant group and we took on their management. Their management was more senior than ours. We were bootstrapping, we were raw, where you know we didn't have any experience. Their management came from, you know, Panera, really experienced places. And I asked them one day. I asked their head manager that came out. I was like, "What are the things that I need to improve on um, in this business to make it better?" And he tells me, and I'm his boss. He goes, "You, you are the number one thing that needs to change." At first, I was like, "What do you mean, me? I'm the CEO." <laughs> I was very offended. You know, but then I realized, yeah, you know, he's right, right? I think back in the day, you know, our restaurants, you know, they could be more organized, more clean, we could be more systematic. And it all stemmed from me. And I realized I need to take myself to another level if my business is going to go to the next level, right? So that's why this slide is really important, right? Get comfortable with feedback. You know, you have to appreciate it. You, the initial reaction for everybody is to be upset about it. But the people that give you the best feedback are like the meanest friends. You want the mean friends to, <laughs> to tell you these things because no one else will. And this is actually, I didn't mention this in the product testing is the people that I first gave the recipe to that gave me the most valuable feedback were my mean friends. They would go to a restaurant eat the spaghetti and be like, oh, that spaghetti was okay. I had a better spaghetti in you know, Spain or something. You, we all have those kind of friends. Those are the people you want feedback on your business and yourself as well. And I've gotten my best feedback from, from my friends. Um, and you can set it up personally, right? You can have, make sure, it's a very important to have close friends and family. I know a lot of people are like, oh, I have a million friends. That's great. But you want really close friends that are able to deliver that feedback and see you grow over the years. Those are the those are the friends that give me the toughest feedback. I mean, they tell you, they told me I'm not a good listener. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they told me I'm scatterbrained. You know, um, you know, my mom give, gives me the best dating advice. But um, so that feedback is so important. You can you can have it per personally. Uh, I would recommend having a professional network as well. Um, this is a group called uh, Ace Next Gen Inner Circles where we meet on a monthly basis and we discuss our issues and we talk about the top five and the bottom 5% issues affecting our, that we don't, don't share with other people. Well, that's why we call it top five, bottom five. So that, that feedback is very important. And I know that you are, uh, your business and yourself is very ingrained in supporting um, the community. 
and you being part or also the founder of Ace Next Gen here in Boston, like how do you think that has helped you propel your business uh, besides like um, the networking? Um, I'm sure there are other intangible things that we need to account for. Yeah, you know, um, great question. That's that's going to be part three. Okay. <laughs> but uh, oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've learned so much besides the network. Um, doing nonprofit work is a great safe space to apply the lessons you've learned from reading or life or whatever. And then when you see those work in a nonprofit, right, you can also apply that to your business and vice versa, actually. So it's just another way to apply your knowledge and gain experience of, along with networking. Um, but I'll get more into that later. I, I'll just quickly wrap up this section. So um, let's see. And then the last part about feedback is you have to be also be able to give yourself feedback you know, uh, and get comfortable with yourself. And I, I actually spent a lot of time by myself uh, because I think it's important. You know, I think a lot of people, uh, you know, they can't be alone. But I think when you're alone, that's when you, you realize these things. You realize these weaknesses. You take the time to process the feedback that people give to you. Um, and and this, is a, this is a yurt for anyone that, uh, may or may not recognize it. It's a Mongolian tent. And uh, I had this crazy idea of just going here one winter um, and meditating for an entire weekend. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, no heat, no electricity. Uh, it was like eight degrees. I had to wear a jacket, every single piece of my clothing and the sleeping bag and I was still cold. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, but it was a great experience. You know, I unpacked a lot of the things that were holding me back as an entrepreneur. You know, I think it, I did a lot of reflecting about what I need to do to, to get to the next level. Um, and what I, and I do this every year, I'll do this. And I'm, I'm actually doing this next, uh, the next couple of weeks as I go hiking, read a great book about life, and I come back recharged, ready to go for the next year. Um, and it helps me be honest with myself about the things that I need to do and uh, apply. Where is this again? This is in uh, New Hampshire. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No wonder all this snow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think we have 15 minutes left. Um, huh. I'll, I'm not sure if we can get the culture today, but I think network is a, is a great place to end. Um, so, I mean, you guys have all seen this quote, your network is your net worth. And the real key is you build it by giving. You have to give first, you know? And, you know, that has led me to a lot of cool networking opportunities. I got to meet Andrew Yang. He came to our restaurant, served some chicken and rice, and I'll get into the story about how I got there. Um, but it's, it all starts with giving. You know, these things don't just happen. They don't just be like, oh, yeah, I met Andrew Yang randomly one day and, uh, you know, we, we did some rallies for him, some fundraisers. You know, I still text Andrew, he'll actually reply to me. Um, but it, it, but there's a lot that goes into that and, and I'll get into that. So very early on, and this is, you know, when I talk about giving, right, the best way to give is, I would say, is join and contribute to a community, right? A lot of people sometimes a little bit unfocused, you know, with, with, with their, their giving, they're just like, send out Christmas cards to everybody or whatever. I, I think that's good. I think you should focus just like the people that give you feedback, focus your efforts into one thing, right? Because, the, the, and for me, it's the Asian entrepreneurship community. And nowadays, that's a lot larger. This is, this is the first group that I built. Um, and now we're, we're like nationwide. But this all started in high school for me, actually. My dad was worked for the United Nations. And so he had always had this like civic spirit that he um, bestowed upon us. And so when I was in high school, I noticed we didn't have an Asian club. So why is there no Asian club? There's like 
black, Hispanic, Spanish. There's a comic book club. There's no Asian. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, going back to, to what you had said about how does it help you? Well, I started the Asian club in high school. Sure, it was, it was a pretty silly club. You know, it wasn't the most well-run club, but I learned a lot about community work and leading others at a very young age that I just started to apply um, more and more as I grew. So from that Asian club, I actually got a scholarship to uh, a diversity leadership scholarship to college. And from there, that helped me become the president of the Asian Student Association there. And from there, I would just kept taking on larger and larger leadership positions. Um, so I started the entrepreneurship group for NAP. Uh, it's the National Association of Asian American Professionals. Then I started my own nonprofit for Asian entrepreneurs. I put in my own money. A couple of my friends, we put $5,000 in. So our own nonprofit gave that money first, gave our time, our knowledge. And now uh, I'm part of the um, National Asian Chamber of Commerce and Entrepreneurship. Huge organization, over 300 people involved in it uh, with an amazing group of people. Uh, Tracy Doy, great role model of mine. She's the CFO of North America Toyota, Xiaowei Lam. He owns this, like 30 car dealerships. He brings in a billion dollars a year. These are the people that are on the board and that I was able to uh, network with and get to know um, because I started off at a very young age doing Asian club and I learned about organizing people and giving back. And through there, I kept building larger and larger organizations and taking on larger and larger leadership positions. And so how do you do that? And what I was taught is the three T's of giving. Uh, you can give your time, your treasure, and your talent. And at every organization, one of those T's applies, right? So in the very beginning, for me, it's always been my time. I'm like a, I'm like a workhorse. I don't have much talent, <laughs> but I got time. Uh, I don't have a lot of money, but you can apply any of those things to give back to an organization. And for this sport, the reason why they let me on the board for, for National Ace uh, amongst, you know, sure I have success, but I'm not nearly as successful as any of these people is because I gave my time and I gave a lot of it, right? But that enabled me to build this network. So what I did is I built the millennial version. None of them, they're all obviously, you know, well, not obviously, I'm going to get in trouble for that. But, but you know, um, they're, all, they're all older than me. Okay. <laughs> they're all older than me. And they, don't, they didn't know a lot of millennials uh, when, they, when they started the organization. So what I did is I built their millennial uh, version of their organization called Ace Next Gen. And that was three years ago. We now are a group of, uh, you know, over a thousand entrepreneurs all over America, different cities, Houston, New York, San Francisco. Um, and I built this organization uh, from nothing, you know, and that's how I got onto the board. And that's how I got uh, their respect because I gave my time, right? Mm -hmm. And as you give your time, you start to build talent too. And now that's the next level is I'm starting to have some talent through all of the time I've given, right? And this is so valuable because, you know, so, so what? You have a big network, right? Well, it helps a lot. And I'm gonna take you back to the first picture. This is Jason, I don't know if he's watching, Jason Lee, he's also in real estate. But he sold me my first restaurant. I didn't have the money for it, but he let me pay him over the course of five years. And that restaurant, that my first restaurant went on to make close to a million dollars a year for its first you know, several years before we open a restaurant close by. But you know, that's the power of the network is when you meet people, right? You give to them, they know you, they trust you, um, and then they give back to you, right? And what I gave to Jason is I helped him with his marketing. Once mm -hmm. again, I gave my time, some of my talent uh, because his, he gave me the restaurant that he used to own that went out of business. Um, it used to be a fried chicken concept and I just helped him because I thought it would be fun with his marketing. Uh, it didn't work out. So he sold me the restaurant because he's going to sell it on the market. But instead of selling it for the cash price, he let me buy it over time. Uh, wow, that's amazing. Them, right? So, so it's all about giving and then you get later. Yeah. 
And uh, I'm going to skip this slide, but. Uh, okay. Well, that's why they say like, right? The network is your net worth. Uh, yeah. So very invaluable asset. Yeah. And you know, this just goes just to reinforce the, uh, you know, reinforce that, you know, all of those years of organizing helped me get to the stage. This is a, a picture of Andrew Yang, uh, the Andrew Yang Boston rally. It gave me the skills and the network to be able to pull things off like this. We had, I think, over 600 people attend this rally. And this was in the very early days where not a lot of people knew Andrew Yang. Um, but we were able to do that with the, the connections and my experience. I knew what we needed to do, how we needed to market it, how to get people there, how to execute it. Um, and uh, yeah. That's awesome. So like, um, we are coming to close to uh, the end of the show, but I wanted to ask you like, what's next for Ian So, Like what, what are your next plans? Yeah, so, you know, I'm still continuing to grow chicken and rice, guys. Um, I think there's a there's a great silver lining uh, amongst a very difficult time is that um, rough times in the economy and life bring great opportunity, actually, for uh, entrepreneurs, uh, especially entrepreneurs, right? Because they're great at uh, being creative, being efficient. So there's, there's, there's a lot of opportunities for uh, more chicken and rice um, in the future in Boston, uh, not in Texas. Okay, <laughs> <Eight down. laughs> but, um, and then I, I started my own consulting company um, doing nonprofit work and uh, small business and corporate consulting. And uh, the idea is to bring entrepreneurial thought and action to these organizations because you know, I've learned so much on my entrepreneurship journey through the experience, through reading, through just everything I've encountered, I want to bring that entrepreneurial uh, spirit to 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 every corner of America as much as I can. That's cool. Is that separate from Ace Next Gen? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. What is the name of your new nonprofit? If you can share. Yeah, it's called uh, Operation Entrepreneurship. Oh wow, that's a cool name. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. All right, so any final words? Um, I know that people were tuning in and out. Um, one person, uh, Jonathan Huang, was asking about your reading list and you already share. I'm not sure if you have other books that you wanna share or recommend. Yeah, you know, uh, Jonathan Huang, what, how's it going, man? I wanna see your reading list. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can, I'm gonna put this um, presentation up on my uh, website later, um, but you can check out all the books there. Um, it's, it's in the presentation. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you can share the link later for the presentation. I'm happy to share as well. Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. All yeah. right, well, thank you so much, Ian. It's uh, a lot of information, but very valuable. I feel that I have learned from you uh, every time that we talk. So I hope to bring you in back next year, and then maybe we can cover about the, the culture piece. Sure. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's 44 pages of my presentation, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, great work. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and anyone wants to... Uh, check out and try uh, Ian's uh, restaurant, the Chicken and Rice Guys. Uh, they are located in downtown Boston, right? And then you are doing catering business. Yep, catering. Need a food truck, let me know. We rent them out. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Have a good day. Delana, thanks everyone.